Happy Friday, everybody. <clears throat> Good to have you back for the f finale. Hopefully it's not the, the big finale. <laughs> Hopefully it's just the week finale and not the big finale. I haven't done all the, uh, the preparations needed for the big finale yet. Anyway, it is the 5th of April. One of my players, Sal, from like the 2010, the 2010 team that I was coaching. It's his birthday today. Always kept up with his family for years after that to wish him a happy birthday. Sal, if you're watching, Sal, happy birthday. It's April 5th. It's April 5th. And uh, we had some, some interesting stuff happen today. Some very interesting stuff happened today, especially over here on the East Coast. Now, I know all you West Coasters, uh, I mean, like your alarm clock is an earthquake. Well, not over here in the Northeast. It just doesn't happen very often. I, I, I am told tales from my parents tell me the tale of the earthquake that happened when I was like less than only a couple of months old in 1985 over here. I'm told the tale every so often. And a couple of years ago, I was working in the in the kitchen preparing a, a format for one of our nightly shows over here. And I felt this this rumble, like a, a, a truck had gone by the house, but there was no truck. So what the hell was that? And I said, was that an earthquake? And then, of course, all the news got around across the Internet that there was an earthquake that had registered somewhere near me. And and uh, that was a little bit of a, uh, you know, to say, oh, there's an experience, a safe enough experience with earthquakes. Today was a little bit more intense. And I knew exactly what the hell was going on. And, um, you know, so, you know, just immediately taking account of everybody, making sure my mother's under a, uh, a doorway, just because I, I, you don't know what's going on, especially when it's a sustained. Now, it felt like 30 to 45 seconds. That's probably just because I'm doing so many things in the course of 20 to 25 seconds. It just felt like forever, but it was uh, it was it was serious and it wasn't, you know, it was significant, I should say, especially since we were so far away from the epicenter, which some people have placed right in the middle of a Trump golf resort in New Jersey. Of course, <laughs> of course, and it was a four point eight. Some people are rounding up to five. Some people say that it's higher. Uh, you know, some geological survey companies or whatever said that it was as high as 5.5, but that the uh, United States Geological Services were, were rounding down or, or downplaying it for some reason. 4.8 is pretty interesting. I mean, it is the date of the eclipse, 4.8. Oh, you didn't think about that? <laughs> we're connected dots to everything. That's what we do. But um, some people did not, some people did not feel it. Like my brother Anthony, he didn't feel it, which I understand now because when I got here to prepare the show, and Anthony's in the other room, he's like, "So, so what the, you know, what was going on this morning? What did it feel like? What was what was happening?" And I'm telling him the story of how everything happened this morning, and that is when I got a text message from my mother, from Lauren. And the chat rooms all started lighting up. There was an aftershock. Aftershock. Did you feel that? Did you feel that? 4.4. And it sustained for about, you know, 15 to 20 seconds again. But a little bit less than what it was this morning. But I didn't feel a damn thing over here in this building. So, um, I guess the day that we do feel something in here, it's going to be significantly more jarring for everybody outside. So, that's, uh, that's something to take note of. This building's pretty solid. You know, knock on wood, knock on wood. So that's what I'm dealing with today. What we all have been dealing with today. It, uh, it, it definitely added a little bit to the, I don't know, added a little bit to the, I don't know, the day to day. It's not going to be, hopefully it's not regular, but something else is happening here. And it just feels, there's just something odd. I don't know, man. It's just weird with all the storms and then this and there's all this all this shits going on. Uh, I guess I guess it figures. But um, but yeah, here, look, here's the New York Post. Matt's not here yet, but he said he's coming by. 
New York City and Tri-State rocked by biggest area earthquake since 1884. So I guess this was bigger than 1985, sending terrified residents into the streets. That didn't happen for us. Um, but, you know, I was once in South Carolina and saw a flurry shut down everything. Okay, back in 2008, it was flurrying and people were, you know, doing it's just like it was like pinwheeling all over the place. So if you put somebody in a situation with that, they're not really accustomed to, you know, a, a, or a or tornado touches down somewhere in Long Island. That's going to be, you know, nobody knows how to react. An earthquake around here. Nobody knows how to react. Just like a lot of people in the south don't know how to drive in the snow. That's just the way uh, it works. Although I would take a snowstorm over an earthquake any day of the week. The preliminary 4.8 magnitude earthquake struck near Lebanon, New Jersey around 1023 a.m. and was potentially felt by more than uh, 42 million people, according to the U.S. Geological Survey. I know friends of mine and viewers of this show as far out as Rhode Island and beyond. My cousin Sherry, who lives about an hour north of here, she felt it. A lot of our friends in Pennsylvania, of course, Pennsylvania right next door to, to Jersey. So there is a lot. I was doing my morning reporting in the safe in my office. That's a ton. Okay, and this, uh, this safe in my office that weighs a ton starts shaking. The whole room is shaking. Monica Horton, who works at the Ballman store and Madison Avenue in Manhattan, said I was just freaked out. Scary, real scary. I'm a New Yorker my whole life, 36 years. Never seen anything like it. Well, you don't see an earthquake, although I guess you, you can't see things shake. But I get it. The can't make this up says amuse on Twitter. The epicenter of the New Jersey earthquake was Trump National Golf Club. That's what some people are saying, at least. That makes this a pretty interesting development for those of you who are putting together your esoteric jigsaw puzzle right now. Dutch since he was able to take a victory lap, though he, he you know, aside from the dramatics of leaving the internet every couple of months, um. His work is undeniable. Extremely rare 4.8 to 5.0 earthquake has struck the East Coast of the U.S. and in New York. This forecast for this week called for a rare M4 plus earthquake to strike from D.C. to New York border with Canada. The forecast is saved in the video from my YouTube channel from two days ago. So he, he hits again. He hits again, but we have been told our whole lives that you cannot predict earthquakes. We've been assured, in fact, that th that earthquake predictions is bunk. It's just it's fooey. It's uh, it's pseudoscience. You might as well just have a crystal ball. So that's crazy. That really is. Uh, tonight, though, on the show, we've got our good friend Max and Caparato. I will be addressing him by his his given name, though, tonight. He's, he has a, provided me with a bio, and he said that it is okay to use his real name. So this is a very, very big day in our maturation of a program. Very, very big day. So there's, uh, we'll be doing that in a little bit. He's going to be coming on. Uh, Max is a um, great friend of the show, and he works in the sciences, especially when it comes to things that are going on in the sky and around the planet. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the, the experiments, the rocket experiments, that are being fired toward the eclipse to try to get whatever. We're going to talk about all the data that's, that is that is being sought right now. Um, not going to get too ancient Egypt with it like we did with Ryan Gable. That show speaks for itself. But I wanted to bring on Max and talk a little bit about the moon, the sun, and uh, and everything else since he is a, a wonderful resource for that and many other things. He's a great guy to just to talk to in general. And... Um, and he usually co-hosts the Alter podcast with our good buddy Ben, based Heisenberg, and Moonlit Matt, all on YouTube over there. You guys should check them out. They're usually streaming on Thursday nights, uh, right after me. And uh, and if you can't catch them live, you can catch the rerun. So go ahead and do that. All right, that's uh, that's all I have for you right now. Let's start this one off, and we'll we'll you know we'll set the table for Max, and we'll have some fun, and that'll give Matt some time to get over here and settle in too. We will be right back, ladies and gentlemen. Don't go anywhere. Maybe you can, um, again, you can rest the punishment. Hi. 
stand up to us, then they all might stand up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. That's why we're going back. Does anybody else want to stay? Let's ride! Oh, this just in. This just in from the U.S. Geological Survey. If you felt the earthquake today, you're gay. This is for real? All right. Well, then to add another thing onto the pile. Just add, add it. Like, just add another thing onto the pile. You know what I mean? Add another thing on. I don't know what to even do at this point. Did, did we just read the 42 million people felt it? They're trying to get the numbers up. Okay, anyway, moving on. We're going into, uh, let, let's go into the, the Babylon Bee to see some of the fun stuff that's going on over there. And then we're going to set the table for Max and Caparato, who's coming on in just a few minutes. He might even be able to do some slides with us because we've got Zoom and he does know how to do a screen share. He is a scientist after all. Here's the first one from the Babylon Bee, since it's Friday. Headline, Canadian man too polite to tell doctor he does not want to be euthanized. <laughs> hey, here's a top comment. It says, I love how we used to admire Canadian politeness. It was obviously a psyop to get people to accept extreme leftism. They've polited themselves into legal suicide. I heard that they're, they're um, talking about approving euthanasia for autism or for something I, I don't know what the hell it is there is just so much there's so much i saw this one cr cr freak this poor uh poor case this woman in the netherlands young girl doesn't seem to have anything wrong with her except she's got some something fried between the ears she's got a boyfriend and everything and she has been approved by the the government out there in the netherlands for a May execution that she's going to she's choosing to just die on her on her couch with her boyfriend by her side and that's it not terminally ill at all just wants to check out what the f you know so um, there's a conversation to be had in there at some point I I'm going to I'm going to stew on that one and see what the hell happens here's another headline for you Headline, Earthquake as Jews dig tunnels too deep and unearth a Balrog. <laughs> a fire demon. Yes, indeed. That happens from time to time. Headline, Parents really in need of a vacation after grueling vacation. Yes, indeed. That is a... Uh, everybody needs a vacation after vacation sometimes. Here's another headline for you, uh, and I, I, I actually, I agree with this one. Maybe Matt will agree, too. Headline, to regain popularity, Major League Baseball is going to allow one player per team to take steroids. Hey, you know, it's, it's not a crazy idea. I had a really fun time during the steroid era. It never made me want to take steroids, 
and it created a lot of uh, excitement, except the fact that when you start breaking cherished records, because you're playing like a spring chicken in the in the dog days of summer in August and September when you should be breaking down and trying to find ways of keeping yourself afloat after six months of playing all over the country. Then, you know, that there, there is something to be said about that. But the excitement level, oh, man. Everybody on gear, damn. Damn, son. The juice. If Aaron Judge went on the juice, he would literally be tree beard from, uh, I, he, he would be an ent. There'd be, I don't know, there'd, there'd be something to that. It'd be like the Bugs Bunny baseball episode. It'd be like a video game. Yeah. Yeah. All right, here's another one for you. The last one. <laughs> the last headline. <laughs> headline, Democrats warn parents to quickly transition their kids before they grow out of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's essentially what it is. They want to just make sure that people are damaged forever so that they'll always need... The invisible, terrible, poisonous crutch that is liberalism and liberal forms of government. So, okay. Hey, Matt, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, if, by the way, hello, everybody is so happy that you're here. Hi. How you feeling? I'm all right. Did it feel like a spring day today when you were working? I was inside. I've been inside for two weeks. Really? Been putting in a bunch of overtime. Yeah, we're redoing all the firehouses. Oh. We're doing uh, one over on Peningo. We tore the wall they had three walls over each other. We had to tear them down, tear the insulation out, take all the old nails out, put the insulation back in, put the sheetrock up. Now we got to put the ceiling up tomorrow. You know, all things said, uh, all things uh, considered, this, this was probably the best two weeks to be doing that with all the rain. Oh, yeah. Usually I don't like to be inside, but this this was fun. Yeah. I mean, on Monday, we we, we get real, uh, we get some good springtime weather, so that's nice. But, but then I had the uh, the storm day where we had to go. Dude, we had to cut huge trees down. Oh. Well, we didn't have to cut them down. They're in the road. Well, you did a good job. You kept us all safe. Indeed. Thank you for keeping us safe, Matt. So there you go. Matt is with us. He's hanging out, and we're going to be bringing in our buddy Max in a little bit. Uh, so you know Max and Caparato is coming on tonight. Yeah, I'm gonna ask him about the face by the moon. Oh, I've seen that. Okay, so you showed me that video. You can ask him. I maybe that's the first thing you we ask him. Just jump right in and say, Max, I gotta ask you about the face of the moon. Do you have that? He'll video? be like, who? Jackie Gleason? <laughs> wait, wait, can, you, <laughs> can you send me the video so I can I can uh, put it up? Yeah. Hold on. Whoops. If you get, I, I how can you send it to me through text? I guess. Yeah, I'll send it right now. All right, well, while you do that, because we're going to talk about the NASA rockets, we're going to be talking about those. I want to know where, where he's going to be for this eclipse and, and what's going on from a scientific standpoint. When you send it to me, I'll just send it to myself an email, I guess, and pull it up because I can screen share with him. But listen to this. Here's a little bit about our guest tonight. Well, first, as you know, Wednesday night with Ryan Gable. We, uh, well, we had Robert Phoenix on in the first half. We did a little bit of an astro reading. We did a little bit of a societal layout and just trying to read the vibes, the, that, that the ebb and flow of energy that's going on right now in the, in the lead up of something that's been hyped to ridiculous degrees in some respect. And then there are also some really interesting synchronicities and other things being put into, uh, into play uh, deliberately by human beings. But then Ryan Gable was on in the second half of the show on Wednesday night. You should definitely go check it out. And we did a little bit of a talk on the dualistic nature of the upcoming rocket launches during Monday's eclipse. Uh, we took a trip back into ancient Egypt. We concluded that no matter what actionable data can be collected from these experiments, which we'll discuss tonight with Max, there seems to be some sort of an esoteric side to this that stretches beyond coincidence and synchronicity. So uh, we don't need to do some of that tonight. But with that on the record, um, tonight, we have an old friend coming on over here. Uh, Ma uh, Max Gilbraith is the planetarium coordinator for University of Wyoming since 2020. The University of Wyoming planetarium serves a 300 miles radius of the Mountain West facilitating education and outreach for K College and the general public serving over 10,000 visitors annually. His career and experience include archaeo uh, astronomy, damn, okay. Uh, inter archaeo astronomy interpretation for the American West, working on full dome and virtual reality productions, 
as a field glacial science technician at the Institute of Alpine and Arctic Research, the NASA's high altitude balloon program. So uh, maybe some of his balloons were the things that were shot down by <laughs> <laughs> maybe the United States government shooting down his balloons, saying that they're Chinese, who knows, and collaborating with NASA's sounding rocket program at the Wallops Flight Facility. We have him on with us right now. He's been on the show for many, many years. A great friend. Max, how you feeling? Oh, living the dream. I, I, you must be. First of all, where are you going to be? Uh, what's your vantage point going to be for this, uh, this, this upcoming Monday celestial event? I had planned to go down to Dallas, and I had a friend who grew up there, and his family's got like a big backyard. And uh, we were just going to camp and chill for the uh, um, weekend and enjoy the eclipse. Um, maybe soak up uh, some water and some sunshine. But the forecast seems to not be participating at the moment. If uh, anybody's looking wait, at wait, that wait, where video. are you going to be? Is it in totality or no? Yeah, I was going to go to totality in Dallas. But, okay, Dallas. I mean, it looks like now maybe I just want to stay um, in Wyoming. So, and maybe get a chance of partial skies uh, and at least see a partial eclipse, but um, getting rained on for an entire weekend while living in a tent and having a 50% or less odds of seeing the eclipse and driving 30 hours. Um, I don't know. I feel like maybe I'd have better odds going to Vegas or something like that. Yeah, probably. Like it was going to be a. It might be a shit show is where I'm at. Well, you know what? Uh, when I think about this, um, we, we, we're going to be around 91%, and we actually have a sunny day coming on Monday. Um, I just think about the passage of time because you, know, you come on this show every so often. Sometimes it's science-related. Sometimes we're just talking uh, you know, free markets. We're just talking about stateless society stuff where we're just shooting the shit. We're talking about cats. But, oh, there, there is Balthazar. The can I tell you, Balthazar is 21 years old. Wow. This, this cat can drink alcohol, okay? Dude. Oh, he's got a mustache, too. Yeah, it's like a little asymmetrical mustache. It's not quite a Hitler stash. Nah, that's what I was thinking, though. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 don't get him excited. He's, he's hey. like a messed up orange Hitler cat. <laughs> <laughs> this is my messed up orange. He's literally Trump the cat. <laughs> you, you know, uh, Balthazar. This is a this is an elder statesman, if there ever was one. He, he's been on this show uh, for a very, very long time. Absolutely, but that's what I'm talking about: the passage of time. I think it was probably around 2016 or so, or 2007, wherever the hell that the the first that 2017. We maybe we were prepping for that one to come across from the Pacific Northwest and then down whatever. And we said, "Hey, Oregon man, to South Carolina, kind of, yeah." yeah. And I think back then we made a promise to each other, or we at least a suggestion that we should get a, a you know a Rochester, New York, uh, you know camping trip for 2024 scheduled years in advance, so we can you know you can almost be like a celestial tour guide for us during this thing. And it, it, it's just crazy how you blink, and here we are. It's on Monday, and we're all like six years older. It's crazy. Dude, I feel so bad about it, too, because it actually looks like it might kind of be clear in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. But if you looked at the climate tables, like it was going to it should be clear over Mexico, but it's not going to be. It's just, you know, they could spray the air with the uh, the chemtrails. You imagine that they want to be such a Debbie Downer that they use the chemtrails to just block everybody's vision of it. It's like, no, well, no, it could open our third eye. Right. And and we could wake up to the possibilities of, uh, of what's going on around us, become aware and uh, rise up. I don't know. That's why there's we should so look many possibilities. directly at it. I'm, I'm, I'm on with you on that one. And listen, there's a, there's quite a few people, uh, Max, who, who talk about, hey, you know, they're telling you not to look at this thing because it's, you know, they don't I'm want looking they, at it. They, uh, I'm going to look at it. I mean, I'm not going to I'm not going to lay there with my eyes open for 10 minutes and watch it. So I, I'll take little glances. But I, you know, let me ask you, how are you? You don't have the close glasses, man? Well, well <laughs> are, is that for somebody who's going to be watching the entire thing? Obviously, you should have some shades on, but. Has there ever been a mass blinding event in all of human history with with, uh, you know, eclipses? Like, w w is it really as dangerous as the television ophthalmologists are saying? Um, 
I mean, it. I I haven't actually seen the stats on how many people injure their eyes during a solar eclipse. <laughs> um, I'm sure somebody does. I'm sure it happens. Um, but <laughs> I haven't seen the stats on it. I don't know if it how real it is. Um, that said, like most people intuitively will like look at an eclipse for a minute or like if, if you glance at it it hurts like you're not you you, you will feel it is february no oh, sorry hold on hold on i'm sorry 20... go ahead no i was just gonna say that yeah you, you even if you glance at it momentarily without protection you will feel the damage occurring so most most people aren't have a small amount of self-preservation right and, and as long as you're not a canadian teenager or whatever yeah yeah, you don't want to be you don't you don't want to be uh, barking up the wrong tree there. Uh, here, here's another thing I want to do for you. I want to uh, show you before we get into the actual science here and uh, and and knowing what you know about the rocket launches that are going to be occurring on Monday. If you contributed anything to it, well, the, the, what data is going to be collected, stuff like that. Matt sent this over to me. Matt, do you want to preface this? Um, do you want to preface this? This yeah, a bunch of people are are all over the world, <laughs> are seeing this face next to the moon, and I think it's the face of God because he's angry. Okay, have you seen here? Look, a face by the moon. They said this is February of this year. Matt showed it to me uh, on this my. This is this is Chinese propaganda. It's coming off TikTok. Fuck. <laughs> no, hold on. Look, Matt showed this to me <laughs> on my birthday. Okay, I want I want to I want to see what you think. Now, it's very ominous. <laughs> very ominous. There he is. There he is. There he is. There he is. He zoomed in next to the moon. His face <laughs> looking right down on us. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit brighter. There he is. Damn. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Max, Max, who, who is that? Who's the face? Do you know who that is, the face? I am Azusu. <laughs> Oh man, I don't know. It could some poltergeist demon. I, I who knows? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It does. It looks like uh, Vin Diesel. It's, it's a god <laughs> looking at us with disgust. Vin Diesel in utero with like his his complete uh, chiseled jawline still intact. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like it's like uh, Chronicles of Riddick Vin Diesel. All right. Uh, so let's get, get let's get down to this, and I'm sure we'll find other things to, to talk about along the way too. I saw this on SciTech Daily, Shadow Hunters, NASA rockets to dive deep into eclipse phenomenon. So instead of going into this and reading it line by line, let's talk to you. W what do you know about this uh, this launch? Are you involved with it at all? Because I know you have some NASA credentials over here. Well, so yeah, I, I should say I don't work directly with NASA, but we I, I have contributed to um, like built uh, in launched uh instruments on one of these wallops sounding rockets mm -hmm. so actually if i screen share maybe oh. i can show some pictures of that can you can you do the screen share yourself or do i have to get make yeah you host? let me uh i just want to make sure i have like some stuff ready for it um okay i think i have a picture up oh okay it says it disabled participant screen sharing okay let me do multiple participants can share simultaneously share uh no hold on maybe make let me make you the host oh i'll okay. just i'll just make you the host and that will hold on oh Check. host of hosts there you go all right you are now the host so you can probably do whatever the hell you want i'm gonna cancel the whole podcast cancel the whole podcast <laughs> i'm leaving i thought he was gonna say i'm gonna come <laughs> i'm gonna go I'm gonna go. Gonna go. all right sorry uh so we've got um so this is the launch area from wallops so this is actually an a sandbar island off of the coast of um virginia so it, it's the little like section of virginia that is the southern tip of like that peninsula that comes down from Delaware and stuff like that uh -huh. and um, so this is the launch uh, pad over here can you see my mouse I can yes it, it, I, I gotta say the earth looks pretty flat from this standpoint Max <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um, here's one of the telemetry uh, uh, observing stations for the rocket um, they've got this radio tower um, and, and everybody's cars parked in the, the observing parking yeah, let's lot get some, let's get some plate numbers please yeah right um most of them are rentals anyways 
Uh, over here, back towards us, there's another one of the telemetry observ observation towers. Um, and, you know, it's just Virginia swampland behind all that crap. Um, let's see if we go to the next picture. So um, the kind of rocket used is, are these Brant um, sounding rockets. Is, this, is it all looking all right? Yeah, it looks fine. Yeah, so it's a multi-stage rocket. So you got your first stage here. And um, that kind of just gets it up into the lower part of the atmosphere. And then the second stage burns off. Um, you see it's equipped with fins, which most modern rockets aren't equipped with fins because we have gimbal um, uh, velocity direction for them. But these, um, they're a pretty dumb rocket. They're actually solid fuel and they just burn uh, basically like a firework, right? Like a, a modern car is a lot more complicated than <laughs> Than these rockets that go to space and it's just mounted on this um basically tower uh that tilts on on tracks um they get gas it up essentially um oh that that morning i got this little picture that's really blurry for some reason um but maybe you can see there's uh one two three there's there were supposed to be more little dots of light i see i sky. see the this, i see the three for sure yeah so there were supposed to be a few different dots of, of um, the planets were aligned that morning. Um, it was like a special alignment where all of the visible planets were, were aligned in the sky. And I guess only like Jupiter and, and the moon. Why does, um, why does Jupiter look so, is, is that, is there any kind of like a blur effect there? Why is Jupiter so massive? I'm, I think that's just me not holding the camera steady. Okay, I was going to say. That's the moon right there. Oh, so. okay. I was going to say Jupiter yeah, looks like the moon. moon. Yeah, okay, so here's the, uh, before you launch a sounding rocket, it's kind of ironic, you, you, send, you, launch, um, you launch test rockets too. So think about like those model rocket kits that are like really fun and bitching and go up like a few hundred feet. Well, at least go up like a mile. Um, but these, the, the main rocket actually goes to space um, and then back. So it's on a parabolic orbit. Um, do I have this muted? Will it share the audio? Um, it may. It should. Okay. I don't. Right. Did, do I don't hear it. it. I think you have to. I think as a host, you have to say share share audio. I, I don't know. Is okay. Can you hear it? No, I cannot. Oh. Okay. Uh, somewhere in the host thing, because you got to hear this thing. It share sound. There we go. Okay. Let me let me go back. <laughs> Okay, here now. Jacket. That's sick. That does sound sick. So, because it's just instruments that you put on board, uh, you don't care how fast it accelerates. So that thing just goes from zero to <laughs> twenty thousand in like a second. Um, and uh, and, that, and that's because that looks almost like a cruise missile missile was fired from an, a, a navy ship. Yeah. So and that's that is really just the essentially the the, the three that are going to be fired up uh, in the direction of the eclipse. That it's going to be that kind of a launch. It's not going to be as uh, you know um, a, a big uh, production as we see at Cape Canaveral or anything like that. No, these yeah these are just sounding rockets. Now um, the nice thing for them is that the payloads have gotten so much more complicated than the '70s. Back in the '70s, they did the same thing when the eclipse was passing over um, the U.S. and uh, they launched something like 30 rockets throughout the day to sounding with with uh, so a sounding rocket. It's kind of like a weather balloon almost, um, except it's got some extra stuff. Especially these payloads, we wanted to measure. Um, the electromagnetic influence of the sun, the solar eclipse on the upper atmosphere because you're filtering out all this light that we normally get and you're only getting exposed to the solar corona and there's some general relativistic effects that are happening. So there's like this ionization wave that happens across um, the eclipse path that disrupts radio communications. I mean, it's kind of like an EMP. like, And so um, and there's going to be... Uh, stuff to magnetic uh measure the magnetic influence stuff to measure uh radiative uh radiation flux alpha beta gamma particles and all that stuff on board 
Um, that's a little bit more what they're interested in um, as far as uh, how the uh, mission is concerned. So that's what I was wondering. Game. I think that's what a lot of people were wondering because you know we're, we're, we've gone into uh, we've gone into other areas of uh, of uh, e examining the timing and all this, but I know that aside from our theories and aside from all of our 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 deeper occult interests there is some actionable data that's going to be gleaned from all this stuff so i i, I want to know what exactly it is so it's it's really just a matter of how how the atmosphere is going to be is impacted at a time is it specifically about communication disruption or 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 is there something else there too um, I, I mean, that's the main thing that would affect us day to day is that radio waves get just basically blocked during an eclipse um, and on certain frequencies and so on. Um, you know, people could use that for nefarious purposes if they wanted to uh, recreate that effect artificially with either ionizing radiation and stuff like that. Um, but why would that so, why would that be, Max, uh, if you can, you can put that into layman's terms for us, if it, it's not like, uh, you know, we're bouncing, are we bouncing frequencies off the moon or I mean, you're talking about the moon getting in between the sun and the earth. You, you would think that any kind of radio frequencies that are being generated and passed uh, you know, w across our planet um is going to be safe from any kind of interference of two other celestial objects that are so far away from us. So why would two objects on the outside of our atmosphere uh, do that? I mean, what 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 is it? Uh, what does the overlap do to 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 I don't know potentially screw up the way that we we talk to each other on a CB radio? Well, so think about when um, back in the day with like AM radio. How you could pick up like a Chicago station from really far away or or like a Denver station, like AM station really far away. Um, and it, what it's doing is it's bouncing off the ionosphere back down. And so if um, the atmosphere doesn't have that layer of radio like impermeability at that specific range, then those waves don't bounce around the same way mm. uh, is one thing that that can happen. But uh, I mean, the effect has to be studied, really, to see what's going on. Um, what I was kind of getting at with the... Um, uh, they used to do 30 launches, but now they're just doing three, and it's because they've uh, parsed out each of the launch into... Uh, the payload can separate into 10 packages along the eclipse path, and it will have different little data points that it can um, use... Or, or, what how do i say it like you know the one launch at rock one rocket launches and then there's 10 devices to measure it up in the payload and they separate when they're in the upper atmosphere or near space and so they they're, they're, they're not leaving and, they're not leaving the earth they're, you're just going you're going to the uppermost part of the atmosphere to see what is well, they, going they breach the atmosphere they go into the lower radiation belts and stuff like that okay and then come back down yeah very so really. let me see. So here's one of the payloads here. Um, and you can see like just the layers and layers and layers of chips and, and data collection devices in there. So. Um, and this is not top secret. This is not top secret for you to show us right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. And uh, there's my buddy. Forget his face. But uh, you hear the door, we, the door bust out. He's screaming. The together. door bust out in the background. You hear the first thing he, you hear Max scream is Balthazar. <laughs> Not a cat. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's there's the the wallops thing. Let me see. Um, let's share. Let's. Uh, so yeah, the one of the things is to look at at ionospheric bow waves and perturbations produced by the eclipse because there's just so many cool little radiation things going on um here let me let me see if i i can share this screen this is this is um so here's some of the old the data here where you can see the eclipse from this is 2017 and there's all these little data points like you know you we launch uh weather balloons all the time um 
And uh, so let it, I'm going to let it loop before I explain the data. So as we can see here, there's this blue blob and actually it starts to produce where we have more data points. It starts to produce this wave pattern. Oh, it's I like see it. Rippling water. Yeah. Isn't that cool? And what now, what is that in particular as far as, you know, what are you, what are you reading? Like what kind of a wave is that? What, what is it? It it just it's a atmospheric wave. So anytime you move a lot of air all at once, it's gonna it's gonna cause static buildups and stuff like that. I mean, it's why we have lightning and everything. So ionization can occur and stuff like that. So this rapid cooling, you know, when you remove six hundred watts per square meter yeah. across the two hundred meter area, and then you've got the cooling from the partial eclipse too. Uh, it has has big effects as as we can kind of tell. So it's it's cool to um, pick out. Uh, what's happening here, and see um, I, I, maybe give us some nuggets of data. Absolutely, that and when can you come in handy sometime later, when you show, you're talking about coming in handy, even just from a understanding how we all work as human beings, we always talk about the phases of the moon and how it has impacts on human behavior. I mean, this is a little bit more of a special event when you talk about it, an eclipse, but ju just in general, these are these are objects that are that are closely married to our planet and are always passing over us. It, it just makes you wonder just how much it actually impacts our day-to-day -day life. And, and, and we don't, you know, most people don't pay it any mind because when I look at something like that, you just see that, that kind of like a spectrometer kind of a energy field readout over there. You say, wow, you know, that's one thing for any kind of a di device to pick up those ripples. But then to, to think that underneath those ripples is a wave of hundreds of millions of people, it's got to affect them. That's pretty, um, that's pretty interesting. Well, I mean, <laughs> eclipses were a big deal all throughout history, right? And yeah. even it took, it took Christianity to stop human sacrifices in most of Europe, right? Before, um, we had when we had eclipses beforehand and then i mean you come into the mesoamerican and south american cultures and it was just absolute carnage uh when they were doing eclipse stuff like they were good astronomers they could track when it was going to happen and then they would get in there uh with the war captives you know tens of thousands of them on on the days of the eclipse and everything like that and it's just imagine the frenzies you can put people in when you seem to control the sky and everything like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I know um, from being able to possess that, uh, that early astronomical understanding of how the moon and the sun is working. If you know, when the eclipse is coming, you, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, pageantry around that so that people who are at the, the bottom of the pyramid so, uh, societally, they really did believe that there was magic being worked through the gods and that they're, you know, they're the, um, the, 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 el the elders over there, they really were in possession of some very serious power and, and, um, and privilege there. So it's, uh, it, it's crazy. Now, of course, there is a lot of, there is a lot of hype. I think that they, they like to, especially when it comes to the media, there is a lot of um, interest in capitalizing on a little bit, uh, maybe a, a very small shade of that, that b bloodthirsty carnage in the past, because um, I don't know, you can say that big milk and big bread industries are going nuts right now. It's like a, like a blizzard is coming through town. Everybody wants cookie dough and make sure you get all of your groceries out of the way. But uh, you know what I saw from Newsweek or somebody else? I, here it is right here. Um, Solar Eclipse 2024, a full list of places that won't see it after the path change. Can you, what the hell does this mean right here? Path chain. Is it that the original uh, calculations of where the, um, the, the path of the moon is going to, to be was off or was there really a change in path, like a change in, in weather pattern? What, what does this mean? Uh, I'd have to read the article because, um, you know, journalists tend to be pretty the not uh, great at, at writing what scientists try to tell them um so it, so go up to that maybe top paragraph paragraph there hold on just a, oh here you go a, a week before the event eclipse eclipse calculations expert john Irwin 
updated the path of totality map with a slight but significant change. Many locations previously expected to be within the path of totality are now just outside of it, while others that weren't expecting to be included now are. In Texas, people living along the path of totality's northern edge through central Texas now have to travel slightly to observe the total eclipse. This includes suburbs northwest of Fort Worth, uh, areas located on the outskirts of Dallas, such as parts of Denton and the Fort Worth Nature Center and Refuge. The southern path expands near San Antonio, uh, Austin, but also, but shortly after that, it begins to narrow again throughout the rest of the U.S. So, I mean, as far as this year, the event is expected to draw large crowds. Officials have voiced concern about stretch public safety. At least four states have urged residents to stock up on groceries. And then it just goes in. It just says this a week before the event calculations were updated yeah the calculations we we have the models we know the eclipse is going to happen but like calculating it down to the mile by mile what's going to be in shadow versus not complete shadow Mm -hmm. is is something you i mean as the moon gets a little bit closer like you can refine that data just a little bit i mean it's best to be towards the center of totality and um get the longest totality but uh if you are near the edges that uh, you know, the calculations, there's, there's some rounding errors and stuff like that. And yeah, I could, I could see it varying by a mile or two. Um, as you go across the earth's surface, it's going to be, um, you know, that's, that's an error of less of one, 1%, less than half a percent really. Mm. Um, when you're doing your initial calculation, it's just, you can't refine it down all the way to like the foot until you're like literally there almost. So, so when when you um, on uh, on Monday when these launches happen, I forgot what you said before. Are you going to be at the launch site, or are you going to have some no. kind of remote remote uh, way of watching the the uh, the launch? Well, I'm sure. Yeah, you should be able to watch like live streams of of the launches and stuff like that. It's just uh, so. No, I didn't build any of the uh, data set collectors or the instruments or anything like that on these these launches that are happening now. The, the launches I did were about two years ago. Okay. Um, and we were, we were doing atmospheric soundings up into the lower radiation belts and stuff like that, measuring. Um, I mean, you do you want to do these sounding uh, missions on a regular basis? And actually, they do them ahead of, like, human flight launches so that they can see what the environment is um, for uh, the astronauts who are going up too? so make make sure it's a little bit safe um but yeah just getting regular data on a on an interval these are really cheap rockets to run um so uh because you know we, we don't care if, uh, <laughs> if they blow up or anything like that and there's no humans on board so well, it's 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 really nice to just get atmospheric data transmitted back to us or picked it up um, in a black box after the fact where we we know what the structure of the atmosphere from the surface of, from sea level all the way up to um, above the exosphere is on earth and then um, that helps our climate models our weather weather data everything like that um, helps makes other rocket launches safer um, for people who are launching um, so okay and, and as far as the payload goes um, I the, the because of course all I have to try to envision all this stuff is movies. I'm thinking about the movie Twister and then trying to put the uh, the Dorothy the Dorothy module in front of the the the, the F5 tornado and then of course as soon as that uh, that that thing gets sucked up, they have all of their computers just light up like a Christmas tree and they see all the readings from inside the tornado swirling around. Um, are all of the readings that you uh, that that people in your field who are actually ha- going to have their hands on with this stuff is that going to be immediately received data or is this something that's going to be uh, collected over a period of you know days or weeks? Um, so uh, the missions themselves uh, we did and typically for this kind of rocket last like a couple hours and so they get up into the atmosphere. Uh, they get into lower space and then um, they come back to Earth. They splash down somewhere in the ocean and they go pick it up. And then, you know, they're really simple. Like I said, simpler than a car is really where the batteries just flick on during launch and start logging the data and you pick it up and you just download the data. 
and you know what launch time was and so you just build it back from there that you know um what the altitude or i mean you you have barometric pressure to determine the altitude and then you also have uh velocity um sensors uh kind of they're like gyroscopes basically where you can sense momentum changes and everything mm-hmm. like that see how fast it's spinning and um what the gravitational force is and everything like that because there's microgravity that you can detect over this kind of scale right when you go 200 miles vertically up um yeah so they're they typically will just gather the data after the fact and then they will compile it all together and you know write whatever they're going to write about it but they're not going to um typically it transmitting live data back is a very expensive proposition that you only want to do on a mission that isn't a return mission yeah um, and a sounding rocket is cheap because it's not a, or it is a return mission it's it's just going out of the atmosphere and back so um let me ask you this is a little bit off topic but you know I, I think I've asked everything I need to know about the 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 eclipse thing now we just have to see the whole day do its thing and then Maybe there's some follow-up questions afterwards. What do you think about the topic of um, polar flips? Not just magnetic poles, but I'm talking about physical ro- physical um, changes in the Earth's position, where we're talking about 90-degree flips. We, we, had, we had a conversation about a, a month or two, two months ago or so with Ben Davidson of Suspicious Observers. And he is convinced that over the next 15 to 20 years, we are going to see cataclysmic changes in the Earth's, you know, rotation and how it's, uh, you know, the North Pole is essentially going to be the equator and that all of the earthquakes, uh, a lot of the migrational disruption of of uh, birds and fish and everything is about something that is imminent and unavoidable. Uh, what, what do you what do you think about this? Because I'm, I'm sure you've had to contend with the, the prospect somewhere along the line. So, you know, as you go back into the geologic record um, and you go into to other records, paleoclimate records, when you're like digging mud out of the bottom of the ocean with trapped air bubbles or um, you're looking at the geomag- uh, the magnetic alignment, of it, you know, there is ma- geomagnetic shift. What gives us the best evidence, and I don't know if he was talking about this, about pole shift is the glacial flows, right? So if you look at... Um, a glacier flowing down um, from a certain spot, it's it's going to tend to drain um, basically towards the sun in a sense. Um, that's not always true. It could depend on local topology and everything like that. But the, uh, the ice ages give us a lot of hints about how um, the earth was oriented at, di- or at least the land on the earth was oriented at various points of time. And, and the earth's poles drift over time um there there is some chatter about dramatic and rapid uh pole drift that's in, i'm not and like you said i'm i'm no i'm not talking about magnetic pole drift i'm talking about the idea that the earth could suddenly change its moment and we would have uh you know moment being the operative part of momentum where we have a a different orientation um and there's like the ice age earth that happened uh, somewhat time in the uh, geologic period. Uh, am I particularly worried about it? No, I don't. I don't. The crust is <laughs> is a solid shell floating on top of a plastic liquid, right? So like we could. Um, one of the ideas I've heard, and this is from a legit geology professor, is that the earth gets top heavy from time to time, right? Like if all of look at look at a map of the globe. And sorry, flat earthers, if you're thinking about pole shift, uh, I don't know what you're thinking about. But if you look at a map of the Earth and, um, you know, North America, Europe, Asia, uh, most of Africa is all in the northern hemisphere. And we've got an ice cap up there. So um, there's an idea that, you know, if you get a a plastic top with all of its its center of mass at the top of that moment, yeah, it could it could shift dramatically uh, especially we're not bedded permanently to this plastic mantle core i i mean <laughs> weird things happen in in a cosmological planetary science sense i i wouldn't necessarily i, I mean profound claims need profound proof 
but there is a mechanism that could cause this yeah yeah and uh, he he was uh, when we were talking about that on the show uh, he was talking a lot about the activity of the sun and how solar rays was uh, in the sun's activity uh, was especially these these big flares and everything else um these they these uh said it was actually making that plasmic that, that plastic liquid layer be- below the crust become a little bit more i don't know viscous a little bit more flowing uh that actually frees the crust up and then of course that's when that that hot top heaviness can probably become a little bit more of an issue perhaps but so there, there was a lot there and i was always wondering i was wondering about eclipses and solar activity and earthquake he was talking about earthquakes a lot too we're getting a lot uh, we see a lot more popping up around here. It's definitely becoming a lot more common to see big earthquakes reported on. Uh, it's very odd over here in the Northeast to get one as uh, as solid as we had it today. Five is is very rare for these parts. So, um, you know, you, you start thinking all these damn things. I'm like, oh, shit. Is New York going to be Brazil soon, Max? I just don't know. But um, <laughs> if you're confident, it makes me a little bit more e- uh, easy going to bed tonight. Well, I mean, there's there's weird things when you look at like the the o- bottom of the ocean, right? When you look at the um, Hawaiian Islands, right? And you, so you've seen the Hawaiian Islands and the undersea ridge of the hot spot that goes across the bottom of the ocean. Here, I, I got a globe right. I don't know if my Zoom background software is going to allow me to do this. Maybe I just use... Yeah, it's going to hate me. Yeah, you just disappeared. You're gone. It doesn't know whether my face or the globe is... is, is <laughs> Wait, which round <laughs> object should we... What was the we... thing for the moon face? It was... There he is. Oh, here he is. There he is. It, it, I think the funny thing about the moon face is just that it's just sitting right there <laughs> and the best thing is that you know if if the moon is illuminated be- from the rays of the sun and the face is sitting right next to the moon then why wouldn't the sunshine just be splashing on the guy's face because why w- it's 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 god oh it's god's face he's disgusted but why would the camera pick it up and not like your <laughs> i eyes? didn't know that it was supposed because to be he's, god he's vampiric and now it's a vampire god. <laughs> this is a vampire god, and he, he was disgusted. So he just sits there by the light of the moon, waiting for his moment. <laughs> this is ret- <laughs> you know what? I wish things were like that. That would be far more exciting. <laughs> it would. It really would. It would be far more exciting. Hey, Max, what do you know about CERN? Oh, so yeah, I just want to show this. this oh, oh big go ahead, go ahead, do that in the Earth's. Uh, so the the can you make, can is you make like that bigger spot? Uh, I guess. Yeah, good. Does that kind of work? Yeah, that looks better. Um, so, yeah, if you look at the Hawaiian Island chain, right, there's a, all these undersea volcanoes that popped up as the Hawaiian Islands were trying to form. There's a ho- consistent hot spot. The hot spot's only in one spot. It's in the mantle. And then the crust is shifting overhead. And it just takes this turn. You know, how rapid this turn was, right? Like, we normally think in geo- geologic time, right, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, so, but it's just something to look at that, like, it's pretty obvious, right? That, that the earth's orientation and, uh, of the crust, at least can rapidly change, mm-hmm. um, even on a geologic time scale, that's a rapid change. Right. Yeah. Um, so, but it, the 20 year thing is, is surprising to me. Um, <laughs> but maybe we get a Permian, um, extinction type event from, Vulcan, hypervolcanism or something like that that's happened before we don't know exactly what caused it so uh you know fuck me i know i know <laughs> hey you, you, here's a couple of things we need to talk about um we got to come back uh especially now that your career is so much more established than the first time we talked about this years ago but i was looking at a conversation that was taking place on twitter it wasn't a very attention grabbing comment like it wasn't uh, very well noticed but uh, people were discussing something that i thought would be a really interesting thing going into the future and that was they were trying to um somebody was trying to galvanize support and attention of people who are really really uh deep into investing in cryptocurrency to uh get together and become the next generation of 
uh, people who fund scientific endeavors in a more independent way. And, you know, obviously you are a free market guy to the uh, to the max. I'm sure that working in the way that you work right now, there's probably a lot of things that you just kind of like accept as just the way things are. Uh, but, you know, what do you, what do you think about that? Do you, do you feel now that you're on the inside that there is a lot of uh, steering people to uh, produce, uh, I don't know, predetermined results for one thing? Or are you not in a very politicized area of science at this moment? I don't I don't feel like physics or astronomy is incredibly politicized. Right. Um, anytime you start jumping into human um, sciences, that's when it gets bad. Um, but uh, gosh, uh, it, it's like when you're. Well, I know the climate, the climate is, is, is definitely politicized. And NASA and, yes. the, and NOAA were, were you know, uh, repurposed in very significant ways, especially during the Obama administration for that mm-hmm. that boondoggle. But but, yeah, go, go on with what you're saying. No, no, it's it's hard to publish anything um, that you might feel counteracts the narrative or you, you can't put out stuff, uh, especially on climate stuff. Um, and you you can be aware of climate and you can say the correct things and then how it gets repackaged to the when it even reaches the media is a huge issue as well um so yeah i i have completely seen that um when you talk to most atmospheric scientists and what their feelings are on climate change and government policy related to climate change it is nowhere near what uh is being portrayed in the mainstream media really um and it's very difficult for them to to talk about what is going on. Um, so, so the, 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 it's so hyper sensationalized uh, for them, and and they're just trying to say, well, we see this trend happening, and if it continues, it'll be like this. Um, but it's a climate scale, and you know, there's rapid changes, and you could have unexpected effects based on rapid changes. But it's still a decades to year you know centuries long process right and um the idea so it it goes down this game of telephone and the worst example is like aoc or bernie sanders where they'll say stuff like you know we're going to turn into venus in a hundred years right yeah and that that's a literal quote from them um that you know our grandchildren are going to be living on venus and uh that's just not the case right like all the carbon that's in the earth's surface right now that we're extracting as fossil fuels used to be in the atmosphere also during the carboniferous period uh and it 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 was just a different climate than what we had today where you know there were ferns growing on the poles of the earth and we you know i it may be worth talking about the rapid earth shift change again but like you know going from a conventional scientific perspective yeah there's the antarctica region used to be kind of tropical right i bet there's a bunch of dinosaur bones underneath the ice right now but now we've got dozens of miles of ice on top of our poles and uh you know this is a thing that's happened and we're extracting that carbon putting in the atmosphere it warms it um so yeah put me in that 97 percent of scientists that says you know humans are extracting carbon and contributing to global warming but you know in my concerned that we might have a carbon level that's consonant with what was 60,000 years ago. I mean, how fast is evolution? How fast is um, all of these different natural processes? We have to find out, but I mean, there's a point where the fossil record shows us that animals are able to migrate. Now, there's, there's a mass extinction happening. It's probably due to mostly land use and ocean use, right? Like, that's the way that we should really focus on client on on protecting our environment um is by reducing our land use and by reducing just like the ocean dredges you know the the fleets of fishing boats dredging the bottom of the ocean and the plastic patches in the middle of the ocean all this trash coming out of these rivers in asia and um you know if if you look at the environment and the climate of developed wealthy nations they're very very nice 
<laughs> and if you look at the climate and the environment of low carbon nations, it's very, very bad. Um, and there's trash everywhere and people don't care and they're burning feces to try and stay warm or cook their food and they're sick all the time. And there's, you know, it's horrible, right? So that everything's a compromise. Um, climate scientists aren't equipped to talk about the economics of everything um, because they're not really interested in it. Um, and that's where we need to talk to economists who are interested in the topic. Like uh, Robert Murphy's a great top source on this. If you want to read his stuff, um, Consulting by Murphy, I think where he goes through the climate reports from um, the climate scientists and talks about, well, you know, the net economic impacts of A and B, if you're not a Keynesian and believe in broken window fallacies, like actually it might, you know, there's, there's trade-offs for everything. Yeah. Uh, well, and that's something we have to, uh, I, we've had some really great climate change conversations over the years too. We got to do that again. Cause I, uh, especially when it comes to the oceans, like my, my buddy, Jim Lee and I, when, when we, when we talk about this, he comes on as a guest, he always focuses in on ship tracks and of course things like, uh, uh, like you're talking about plastic content and things like that as, as real actual uh, makes big impacts. So we got to talk about that. One last one last quick question for you before we we take off for the evening, because I have to go on an intermission here is CERN. Do you know too much about do you know anything about CERN and what they're about to do on Monday? Yeah, so I'm not as much of like a, a matter physicist. OK, um, I don't I don't get into the subatomic particles. I mean, I know the basics right um and uh the nature of the testing that they they're trying to do and and kind of what they're going for but i'm not um necessarily uh deep down trying to do the solve the equations to figure out what the gravity you know mar molecules are or you know how they're trying to create dark matter or something like that got you okay um, but you know i i can describe what a synchrotron is and um, well, it was more so the timing of the, you know, uh, the all portal uh, to the other side theories aside. Um, I, I heard I was reading that they wanted to uh, test this particle accelerator during the solar eclipse, like the timing of the solar eclipse, the day of and then, of course, the days, you know, just being within that window 48 hours after on the 8th and the 10th. That was important to them. Um, I just didn't understand how um, what was going on outside of the Earth's atmosphere what had anything would have any kind of impact on what is going on inside of that closed electromagnetic system on the ground. Uh, do, does CERN take it's, anything from from outside? It's not super closed, right? In a sense, you know, you look at that. These are this is just a picture but you know granite is a great conductor of electricity it was why you want to get off a fucking mountain when it's lightning um and so even under the swiss mountains um you can conduct electricity and fill uh, em fields and magnetospheres so during an eclipse if you're blocking out the main flux of the sun uh that that's something worthwhile you know to just check out like what happens right right um if if we're receiving less solar flux like how does that same experiment we did um occur right because the electromagnetic waves they they can um conduct through planetary surfaces and they can get redirected by them and they can get stored and charged into them and they can discharge from them so there's there's i think a lot of cool experiments to be done um even if it's the same experiment you've done a hundred times, doing it during a solar eclipse is, uh, is, if it's related to EMM, is is kind of a cool experiment. So well, I, I get why they're doing it. Okay, well th that makes that makes it a little bit more sense to me. I just didn't understand because I think about these seventeen mile long uh, tubes of magnets, and you know the, the the neutrinos are in the center of the magnet. I'm just like, well, what the hell does the moon have to do with something that is enclosed in this? in this uh this magnet tube but that uh what you just said there is far more edifying than i had before so thank you for that max <laughs> uh you've got a lot going on but you don't really have a very public brand that you are uh you're promoting do you want is, is there any kind of a blog or is there any kind of a web anything that you want to promote the alter podcast or do you want to just say hey i'll see you next time tell everybody goodbye in, in any way that you find appropriate 
Um, it's it's great to chat with everyone. Uh, I, I love seeing um, the chat and uh, hope that you all can check out uh, the altar sometime. If you're interested in Frank's media, you'll probably enjoy that as well. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're in Wyoming, ever uh, think about um, coming and uh, enjoying our vicious, uh, our spacious mountainscapes and everything like that. Uh, think of me. But uh, also just... Uh, Stay free, taxation is theft. That's it. <laughs> Stay free, taxation is theft. And if you're ever in Wyoming, look Max up. Thanks a lot, buddy. Cheers. All right, take care. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. All right, it's me. It's Matt. Matt, what do you think about that? This is very interesting shit, bro. But well, I still think that that face is a god. I know, I know. And I know that that was, re- that was really... You really wanted to get some clarity on that tonight. <laughs> I know you did. But um, who knows? It could be God. Here's what we'll do. We're going to go on a break. When we come back, we're going to look at the video again. And we're going to take calls from people. And uh, and we'll just see We'll just see how we're, everybody's doing on Earthquake Day today. And Did you feel it today as you were doing your thing? No, I didn't feel anything. I never feel these earthquakes. Well, we don't get them, really. The ones that we have gotten, maybe we'll start getting more because we do have the biggest fault line on our uh, side. The New Madrid runs through us? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, listen, Matt is here. Frank is here. We're hanging out for another nearly an hour. So join us over on quitefrankly.tv on pilled.net. All those links are out there for you guys to easily click and follow us over. The fun does not have to end. Um, Yes, this show in its entirety is archived across BitChute and Rockfin and um, Rumble and so many places that host podcasts, but there's nothing like live, and it's the end of the week. We're not going to see each other until Monday. So uh, come on over. Let's have a good time, and I will see you in just a moment. No! Please! The rest of the show is available exclusively at pill.net. Follow the link in the description of the episode, get signed up, it's that easy. Or head on over to quitefrankly.tv, just press play. No paywalls, no censorship, no strings attached. So head on over, quitefrankly.tv, powered by Foxhole, and pilled.net. It's intermission time, folks. Time out to press the like button. Thank you. Welcome to Intermission. We'll we'll be right back. Yeah, Intermission. Quite frankly. 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 Quite frank